All right, welcome back to 418. Hope everyone is healthy and safe and quarantining themselves appropriately. Um, today we're gonna try this flipped lecture, so you're gonna watch this before class. Um, and we're gonna change this, the curriculum. I'll get a new curriculum out to everyone pretty soon. But basically, since we're all talking about um, a pathogen going around right now, figured we could talk about waterborne illnesses and actually discuss a little bit directly COVID-19 since it's so um, prevalent in anyone's mind. Um, I have a great studio type setup in our work office, but I'm not allowed to be there. So I'm recording in my home office. So excuse the sort of echoey loudness. Okay. So the goals for today are essentially to discuss how the class is going to change going forward, um, understand historic and modern waterborne illnesses, which are, tend to be the same, um, discuss how accurate data is really important for understanding disease spread, whether it's waterborne or airborne, um, and then talk a little bit about how airborne illnesses like COVID-19 spread and why they grow at an exponential rate, exponential rate unless we um, do quarantine ourselves. And then I want to discuss data quality and availability with COVID-19 specifically. Um, so I just kind of want to go over the way we're going to handle class from now on. Um, this is obviously going to be a bit of an experiment, so this could change over time. Um, but first, um, to... You know, we're going to have paper discussions still. We're going to try the, to have those. And those will be the only ones that will be a lot easier if you can make it to the actual class time. And the way that will work is that we'll assign um, different people different papers. They'll meet up in a small group um, vir off uh, virtually, like on Zoom or Google Meet. We'll give you instructions for that. And they'll discuss their paper for 10 to 15 minutes. Um, this will be during class time, ideally. And then those groups will then present their papers to the whole class for 10 to 15 minutes. So the whole class will sort of watch virtually. Um, and then a second set of small groups will form where different people have read different papers and they'll be discussing sort of the overall lesson. Um, so like next week, that'll be about modern waterborne illness spread um, globally. Um, and then we'll finally meet up as a whole class and sort of discuss the general knowledge that we have. If you can't make these for whatever reason, you just can submit a one-page summary of your assigned paper. And um, we'll record all the discussions that go on for the whole class. So you can watch those to see sort of how um, your paper fit in with the larger context. This one will be the only one that I really prefer people try to make it. Um, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And we'll try something else. Um, the next thing is a flipped class. So that's what this one is. I'm going to keep you all on your toes with these texts flying in from the left and right. So basically for these ones, you watch a video before class and um, all the embedded videos. So you're going to see in this slideshow, there's a bunch of embedded videos that I'm not going to play, but um, I'm going to share those slides with you and then you can watch them. Um, again, all these should be done before class. And then during class time, we'll be available to work on the assignments um, and help you out um, with the assignments. Um, and we'll just have the same sort of meetup. So we'll be in a virtual room and be available for help. And that'll be Miles and me primarily for 418. Finally, I've thought a little bit about how to do something new. Um, so I thought one thing would be interesting to do with some of the research that I've done and other guest lectures might do is actually do a Twitch streaming or a YouTube streaming lecture. So basically, instead of raising your hand to ask questions or interrupt or to get clarification, you can just do them as a text stream on the right hand side of um, the stream of me lecturing about some content. Um, I think this could be an interesting um, idea and I kind of want to try it. So basically you would just log in to Twitch or YouTube and then you would be able to add comments and that would help me sort of like answer questions during the lecture and um, try to preserve some of the live lecture nature where you can give direct feedback um, as we go. Um, and then I would record them so that if you can't make it to that to ask questions and you could watch it later. Obviously, this is going to work better the more people that are able to make it during the live stream. But um, I understand that that might not be the case. Um, so for the final, we it's basically the same idea still. You're going to be presenting a water quality topic that we didn't cover in class. Um, instead of, as we discussed on the last day of in-person class, um, you won't be presenting to the class in a live lecture. Instead, I'll want you to upload a YouTube video explaining your um, contaminant and 
how it contaminates the environment, how it gets into the environment, what it does. Um, I'll also be uploading a demo of how to use this open broadcast software, which is what I'm using now. That's called OBS and open shot video editor so that you can make these videos and make them relatively high quality. Um, and I understand if you don't want to sort of make YouTube videos, that's not everybody's thing. I really prefer them because they'll be really helpful in the future um, to sort of have people look at the quality of presentations and then also just to uh, share with people for covering content. But if you don't want to do this, then you can still write a paper um, as the final. So just getting back to the goals for today, the class is going to be changing a lot as we go forward. Um, I'll do my best to get you information at least a day ahead of each class, um, but preferably longer. And then now we'll just sort of jump into that lecture for today. So um, in class so far, we haven't really talked about historic and modern water waterborne illnesses, and that's because we've largely focused a lot on the U.S., but um, there is basically a long history globally of waterborne illnesses really sort of holding humanity back and killing lots and lots of people. Um, and this video that is here is from Crash Course World History, so they have Crash Course Chemistry and then they have like the History um, and Political Science one. And it's an excellent 11 minute video that just explains the sort of history of disease. They don't focus just on waterborne illnesses, they focus on any illness, but just focusing on how disease has sort of changed the course of uh, human history and, you know, pay attention to the diseases in there that are waterborne illnesses, particularly when it comes to sewage and other problems. So you'll just watch that uh, 11 minute video after you watch this one. Um, but basically, it covers how malaria and other waterborne illnesses um, have changed. The history of humanity um, and then there's another lecture that is more specific to waterborne illnesses out of the Oklahoma University and that's just another nine minute video where they really break down uh, the four different kinds of waterborne illnesses and sort of discuss um, why they're still a problem so a lot of these diseases were really big problems in the in the global sort of north the west Western Europe and United States in the 1800s and early 1900s, but largely because of sanitation, we've gotten rid of major diseases like cholera and other things um, that are waterborne, but there's still major issues in other developing countries. So that's a nice little nine minute video. So um, there you're seeing my first hiccup. I was gonna summarize those videos, but I just kind of did anyway, so. Skip that. <laughs> um, well, something I wanted to sort of just highlight that um, is different or that is really kind of an integration of my interest, certainly, is that some of the earliest spatiotemporal data visualizations ever done were done um, to, to explore waterborne illness. And this is really a, f a famous, famous example by a essentially a, a proto-researcher and whose name was John Snow. Um, and what John Snow did is there was a cholera outbreak in London and what John Snow was commissioned to do is to figure out why and where it's coming from. And so what he did is made this little map and on the map you can see these streets, they're sort of labeled. And then there's these little histograms and what those are is those are household deaths from cholera. So each sort of like block on the histogram is a death at one of these places. And we're going to work on this in the assignment. We're going to actually download and work directly with this data. But what Jon Snow essentially was trying to do was visualize the data of where people were dying. And once he saw this, he was able to find a pump that had been infected with cholera and was getting all these folks sick. And so this is a really famous story about sort of the beginnings of epidemiology, the beginnings of sort of finding out where a disease is um, starting from and then how it's spreading in the community. And this is the sort of earliest case of that. And it really is the start of modern sanitation engineering because once we knew that cholera was coming from water uh, essentially dirty water water that had mixed with sewage um, we then started to look out into our cities and f realize that people were getting sick because they're drinking water from the thames and the water upstream is someone else's sewage water and so that is sort of how we learned about the spread of waterborne illnesses um, this is just one example there's a lot of other examples in germany and of other people sort of finding out the same issue and we're going to work on this as an assignment. But the main idea is here is that he was able to find exactly the pump that was causing the cholera outbreak by visualizing the data in this really interesting, unique way that is quite powerful. 
Um, there's a ton of info on Jon Snow, um, so I encourage you to read the CDC blog, and then this YouTube video is a nice just sort of summary of um, that particular story. And if you talk to epidemiologists, this is like the, the classic way that we think about the formation of that field. Um, so as I was mentioning, you know, once Jon Snow in 1854 discovered that essentially dirty water, water mixed with sewage, was poisoning and killing a bunch of people in London, um, there's a growing recognition globally, but specifically in London, that the Thames was so dirty and so dangerous that they needed to clean up the Thames. And so this is a, a sort of newspaper clipping um, from this famous event in London in 1858 called the Great Stink of London. And legend has it that it was called that because the river was so polluted and so disgusting and filled with sewage water that um, the British Parliament canceled their meetings for a week because they couldn't stand to, to, to be in the miasma, the sewage sort of air, um, and basically... During their off week, they were like, okay, we need to fix this. And they hired an engineer whose name was Joseph Bazalgette. And he was sort of one of the earliest sanitation engineers. So his job was to figure out how do we get less sewage into the Thames River. And so this sort of image is of this famous event called the Great Stink of London. And rivers globally were going under the same kind of thing because we're having much denser urban populations in Paris and New York and Chicago in London and basically people were essentially drinking their own sewage water and it's incredibly dangerous. We now knew at the time that that can cause cholera outbreaks and so this was sort of the, the start of modern engineering and this, this famous event called the Great Stink of London and then that started sanitation engineering which eventually became environmental engineering um, which is basically like cleaning up water at the time. And this wasn't just reserved for London, of course, there was a many other rivers. This is a really nice five-minute animation of the Chicago River, which used to flow into Lake Michigan. But because the city of Chicago took their drinking water from Lake Michigan, they had to do all this stuff to try to figure out um, how to essentially deal with drinking their own sewage water, again, just like the city of London. And where in London, what they did is they just routed the sewage directly to the ocean because they were close to the ocean. In Chicago, they couldn't do that. Um, in Lake Michigan because there just wasn't the ocean sort of currents pulling away the sewage. It's kind of just sat there and poisoned the lake. Um, so they eventually rerouted the entire Chicago River so that all of their sewage didn't go into the Lake Michigan where they were drinking. Instead, it went to St. Louis through the Missouri River. Um, or, yeah, so the, through the Missouri River. So it might be the Mississippi. I'm nervous, but it's one of the two. <laughs> and um, you'll this video is a really nice little five-minute video that you'll watch on that. Um, another little slide mistake there. So now we'll, we get to sort of this idea uh, that data quality allowed us to understand waterborne illness in the 1850s, and that immediately led to a bunch of engineering interventions to sort of save millions and millions of lives by preventing cholera spread and preventing the spread of other waterborne illnesses. Um, with airborne illnesses, we don't have the same sort of we can't build infrastructure to stop airborne illness. Instead, we have to react on a sort of daily basis to incoming information about who has the disease. And that's because all it takes is you sneezing five feet away from someone and some of your virus particles get onto their hands and then they touch their face um, and then they sort of can get sick. And that's just a much more, uh, a, a disease that can, can spread much more quickly than something like a waterborne illness where it's you have to go sort of to that water body and drink from it. Um, and so these that's what we're seeing now in the current pandemic is this this exponential growth of an airborne illness. And this video by uh, Kurz Gazette, which is like, it means in a nutshell, is just, I think, an excellent explainer for what's going on with coronavirus and why um, it's such a big disease and what zoonotic diseases are and why we should know about them. And I think it's just relevant to know, not just for this class, but for your life. Um, it's just a nine minute video. Um, and we'll sort of go into in the assignment why it does relate to waterborne illnesses, because I think one of the reasons we're not um, as a globe all acting the same is because every country has different sort of interpretations of data and different access to quality data. And we'll sort of discuss that in the homework assignment um, tomorrow. So just watch that video and um, then, you know, sort of 
we'll discuss it and work on it in class. Finally, I just wanted to talk a little bit about, I'm sure some of you have been seeing this in the news, but um, there's a lot of data coming in on coronavirus, but one of the core sort of things that is slowing down the management or, or rather the collective action of all states in the U.S., let's say, or all countries in the world, is that they don't have equal access to data. And that basically comes down to different access to testing. Um, so if we go to this website called ourworldindata.org backslash coronavirus, it's just a wonderful website sort of visualizing um, a bunch of the data that's going on or a bunch of the data for the coronavirus outbreak. And um, they have sort of aggregated a bunch of the information for you here. And one of the things that they discuss right at the top is basically this idea of the coronavirus testing. And, and we're going to go look at this visualization. But basically, the amount of tests per capita varies enormously across the globe. So these are different countries that have been testing for coronavirus. On the x-axis is the confirmed cases. So that's the number of people that have gotten sick from coronavirus. And then on the y-axis is the total number of cases. And so if you're, there's, you could kind of see like a one-to-one -one line at about, for every 100 confirmed cases, there's a thousand tests. So basically 10% of tests have a positive case. Um, and if you're above that line, that means you're testing more than everyone else. And if you're below that line, that means you're testing less. And so when you're testing less, what that tells you is you, you don't necessarily know how many people in your population have coronavirus, and therefore you don't necessarily know how to react. And um, that is sort of the problem. And even though the United States is way out here, we're, we're, we're a little, we're below the one-to-one -one line, because if we were on the one-to-one -one line of about testing 10%, we would be a little bit closer to South Korea. But there's a big difference between South Korea data and how much they know who has the disease and how South Korea reacted, even though both South Korea and the United States found out about their first coronavirus case, virus case on the very same day. South Korea was able to ramp up testing a lot quicker per capita than the United States. And so in the United States over here, we're testing less per capita than South Korea. And our, our reaction has been a lot slower, I think in part because the perception that it's in the community is lower, but that perception could just simply come from the fact that we're not testing as many people. Um, so this is just one of those cases where without good data, like Jon Snow had, um, we can't make unified decisions globally. Um, we need to test more essentially to know what's going on uh, with coronavirus and what's where it's spreading. If you're in uh, the 419 class, we're actually going to look at the same kind of data, but just for the U.S. states and try to figure out what predicts which states or countries are testing at high rates and at low rates. Is it wealth? Is it just access to money? Is it age? Is it sort of political leanings? What's going on? So anyways, this is just a sort of really nice visualization of who's testing and what's the highest testing per capita. Um, and it's, it's a very useful site for thinking about data quality, which is going to, of course, feed into our decision making. Um, and so now if you go back to the, this main website, I encourage you to just go here and, and sort of read a little more about coronavirus as a, as a, with your data analyst hat on. There's a ton of useful information in here. And um, I think that it's just kind of helpful to understand where we're at. And, you know, it's changing really quickly. And this is a website that I personally have been going to. Uh, fairly frequently just to sort of look at different aspects of the coronavirus. So, for example, how long did it take for the total number of ca cases to double? In the United States right now, that doubling rate is every three days, whereas in Italy they've been able to slow it down a little with their nationwide quarantine. Um, so this is just kind of the useful place to go when you're thinking about how we understand coronavirus and what's going on in the world. Um, that's all I had for today. Uh, we'll distribute this lecture and the assignment today, Wednesday, which is before class on Thursday, and I'll see you in class.